Dr. Andrew Levin began his music career at 10 years old. He was inspired by his siblings to start lessons in violin and piano. During his early teens, he switched from violin to viola, and then went on to earn six degrees. He got a Bachelor of Arts degree from California State University, where he double majored in violin and piano performance. He then continued his musical formation at Rice University, and he graduated from there with a Master's of Music in Orchestral Conducting, as well as one in Piano Performance. After receiving his Master's, Levin then enrolled at Ball State University, where he earned his doctorate degrees in Viola Performance and Orchestral Conducting. While teaching at Clemson University, Dr. Levin had a colleague, a math professor, who was really invested in contradance. This colleague introduced Levin to contradance, and Levin ended up creating a contradance band and writing music for them. This contradance band included himself, a violist, as well as a couple of friends, a flautist and a cellist. The waltzes that we ended up playing were from two individual collections of waltzes that Levin published, entitled Six Waltzes and Six More Waltzes. Dr. Levin's process of writing the waltzes was fairly unscripted. As he was going along, each individual piece was being set in a different key, and he thought to himself that it would be interesting to write a series of waltzes following the harmonic fifth progression. However, many contradance musicians don't have the skill set necessary to play complex key signatures, so Levin decided to not follow the harmonic fifth progression and instead set each individual piece in a key that just made sense. Andrew Levin oftentimes uses the piano or sings to himself to keep musical motifs alive before he can put them down on paper. He also uses technology to his advantage when composing, such as using compositional software and recording devices. Andrew Levin describes his composition process in a unique way, saying, The waltzes have always chosen me, not I them.
Just a preface, when I'm referring to the instrumentation, I'm just going to be referring to the original instrumentation. But when we actually performed this, due to our ensemble and instrument, instrument makeup, we had uh, Catherine play the first violin line, clarinet, Ben play the viola line, um, violin, and then Sean play the cello part, as opposed to viola. The overall form is somewhat of like a sectional binary with two distinct A and B sections. There's a little up for debate on whether or not it could be considered ternary, just because the second page of the score, this B section, kind of has its own form, it kind of has its own two-part form. But just based on the length and the things that occur in the different sections, I just kind of had an over-encompassing macro of just viewing it as binary. So the uh, the first section, the A section, consists of a thinner texture than what appears later on in the piece. So we just have this pretty simple melody and accompaniment occurring between the first violin and the viola. There's just a simple melodic motive, this uh, dotted quarter note into the three eighth notes into the three quarter notes after. That's just played over the moving line in the viola. And then the cello is just playing this D pedal pizzicato in the bass, like pretty much the entire, yeah, the entire A section is just the cello playing that thinner texture and that's just kind of there for accompaniments. The B section has a much denser texture. The cello is now playing a more harmonic moving line, kind of adding some motion, feeling like the piece is going somewhere. And the viola and the first violin trade off the melody, so the first violin at first, at the beginning, it's just kind of holding these long tones, but later on, you know, 45, uh, there's this, uh, this interplay between them. At 53, they kind of sync up at times to play the melody together, which I'll talk about more in a second. But I'm going to go more into what's going on in the A section. The A section is just kind of strictly in D minor. It's mostly just the usual chords that it would appear in D minor. So you have the one chord built on D minor and then the five chord, which is A major. Sometimes we see the occasional C sharp uh, diminished chord instead of the A major. But for the most part, it's just revolving around those two chords. A couple other things to note in terms of the harmony is this, uh, this harmonic line, this accompaniment in the viola is, is a little different. It's not just playing one chord. There's, there's kind of like this neighbor tone this, that's added on this, uh, this B flat, uh, which is the flat six in the key of D minor. So if you're using lead sheet symbols, you could say it's kind of like uh, one add six if you minor add six. But it's really just, it's functioning as the tonic, this chord, and then it's just kind of adding a little bit of intrigue. And then the main melody, as I described earlier, is functioning around this mode, which appears throughout the entire piece. So Levin's definitely kept some motific consistency, and then just uses this, travels throughout the different pitches to follow the chords. So here you have the C sharp, go to the C sharp play five chord and such, and it comes back to D here. And then one more thing that kind of happens in the A section is there's a couple instances of D major chords. So there's that F sharp that shows up. And at first it shows up as a 504, as like a secondary dominant, leading into a G minor chord. And then near the end, during the transition into the B section, it's kind of used as a modal mixture, just kind of trading between the minor and major. Levin has the, uh, the viola playing that F sharp Kind of giving us that modal mixture of feeling of the D major for the first time and then it transitions back into that F natural back into D minor to lead us into the start of the B section.
And then the B section is a little more complex. So it's not necessarily an exact binary because the B section kind of has its own micro form. The first part of the B section is just following a similar motive that we saw at the beginning with an increased texture like I described earlier. Chris Ballon's just holding these long tones. Starting right around measure 53, the harmony changes a little bit. So we're actually in what feels like B flat major. This key change is just kind of playing that same melody over different chords, giving us a different feel for this section of the piece. And the texture is also heard a little more here as well. So instead of just the first violin holding these long chords, there's some more motion, and that actually starts right around like 47. There's some more motion going on, adding to the counterpoint, adding to the texture a little more, hearing multiple lines. Um, there's times where it links up with the, the viola part, the first violin part kind of links up, and then it breaks off. The climax of the piece kind of occurs at 62. So this is when the first violin and viola sync up. They're playing the same rhythms. So the texture is kind of reduced down to these two voices almost. This motive has been hinted at a little earlier on in the piece back in like measure 47 to kind of contrast our main motive. But it's really more developed here as kind of like a main melody during this climactic section. This is one of the most uh, important parts of the piece that I analyzed. Well, I haven't really pulled out all the stops here. Leading up, it's a uh, five of four, giving us that D major chord. And then we land on an A minor chord, starting off a circle of fifth sequence. So we have the cello kind of playing this running line, um, outlining our chords, starting with G minor, going into C minor, going into F, then going into B, and then B goes to E, and then back to A. And this main melody is harmonized in sixth, so first violin is a sixth over the viola, and they're just playing in harmony this beautiful melodic line going into the end, and then the whole piece repeats. So that's kind of the overall analysis that I did of this piece.
going into the response composition, uh, I tried to write in a similar style, but obviously not copy everything that Levin was doing in his piece. So some of the main elements that I tried to emulate were the types of texture he uses in the different sections. I have a similar form, kind of like a macro binary form. And then some of the harmonic devices he uses as well. So starting off, I have this thinner texture going on here. It's a similar melody and accompaniment. The accompaniment is flowing eighth note lines. And then the melody is a, a simple motive. The second violin is just playing pizzicato. So it's similar to the A section of Levin's piece where it's just two strings, one bow, and then one pizzicato. My melody is kind of similar in motion. Levin's got like a longer followed by shorter. And I have that as well. So it's kind of a, a similar rhythmic um, motive, but just obviously altered a little bit. So it wasn't copying. As far as the harmonies go, I've used a little more predominant harmonies in this A section. So it's not really just one and five. I've also, but I've copied the, uh, the use of the five before. I've used that as well the secondary dominant. And then I have an intersection in between the A and B sections that I added in this kind of transition where the texture gets pulled back again. There's more pizzicato and then kind of a two-part little contrapuntal section where there's no main uh, melody and these the viola and uh, second violin are trading motives, um, which isn't something that Levin did, but it's something I wanted to add in to contrast. And that's also modulated to B minor. This is 10 measures are in B minor while the rest of the piece is in B minor. Just to have some contrast. But then the B section, when it does show up, is a similar start to the B section like Levin does, where it's following the same uh, rhythmic motives, but just over different chords. So I've gone to the relative major, as uh, he does in his piece, and just kind of played over the same melody for two phrases. And something else to note, I've also applied the cross-relation uh, that Levin uses in his piece. So he has the C natural over the C sharp. I've used uh, B natural over the D sharp, which is the leading tone as well, to kind of uh, get that same feeling of just more dissonance in the harmonies. And I've actually uh, used it more prominently. I've used it as a part of my main melody instead of just in harmony. Another thing that I've uh, done that's very similar that I really wanted to make sure I included was this climactic section, this circle of its sequence underneath the harmonized sixth melody, starting at around 57. So I've done just a similar thing in E minor. I have the five up four, this E major chord, going to our A minor chord, going to our four chord, looping around the circle of fifths uh, for that whole phrase, while the first violin and second violin are harmonizing in sixths. Uh, I've done something a little different. I've added some suspensions as well, just to get some more emotion and some more dissonance into those chords. This is a new motive that I've added in, just like Levin did uh, when he had that section, uh, that climactic moment in his B section, just because, you know, the piece needs to feel different at this moment. That's pretty much the process of my composition of this piece. Andrew Levin's Gypsy Waltz from Six More Waltzes is structured through its harmonic progression and motivic material. There are six sections of the piece, A, B, C, D, E, and the coda. Each section is determined by a change in repeated motives and is also marked by a harmonic cadence. Within these sections, there are various phrases. I have differentiated between motivic and harmonic phrases as they don't always line up perfectly until the end of the section. The harmonic phrasing is determined by the chord progression and is often ended in a half or authentic cadence, occasionally a deceptive cadence, while the motivic phrasing is determined by the use of motives within the phrase. Section A makes up measures 2 through 17 with measure 1 serving as a pickup into measure 2 in just the first violin part. This section is comprised of four primary motives. The first violin part plays two of the primary motives, being motive B and motive C. Motive B serves as a two to one suspension, resolving on beat three, while motive C is an eighth note figure that consists of a neighboring leading tone, followed by an arpeggiated pattern. The second violin repeats motive D, a quarter rest followed by two repeated quarter notes throughout the section. Motive E is in the viola and is marked by two slurred eighth notes ascending by a fifth, followed by the root of the chord. Section A is made up of four phrases. Phrase A1 is played three times and then is followed by phrase A2. It's important to note that phrase A1 is the primary melody of the piece. 
The harmonic phrasing lines up pretty well with the motivic phrasing, but there are two motivic phrases for each harmonic phrase in section A. There is no counter melody in section A, and instead the second violin and viola serve as an accompaniment and outline the chords within their own motives. Section B starts at measure 18 and ends at measure 33. The first violin continues to play the primary melody from the previous section. However, the second violin and viola both introduce new motives. The second violin actually takes on motive C, which means that motive C occurs in every measure of the section and is passed between the two violins. The harmonic phrasing of section B is very similar to that of section A with two motivic phrases per harmonic phrase. The chord progression of section B is the exact same as section A, and just like section A, there are four four measure motivic phrases, with B1 being played three times, then followed by B2 being played once. In fact, the only difference between sections A and B is the change in the motivic material in the second violin and viola. Section C contrasts from sections A and B harmonically, stylistically, and structurally. Section C is in G major, the relative major key of E minor, which is the home key of the piece. The J motive is introduced in the first two measures and is characterized by its ascending stepwise motion and staccato articulation, which contrasts from the primary legato melody. While there are still four four-measure motivic phrases in section C, there is an alternation between the two motivic phrases, C1 and C2 and they are differentiated by the use of J or C motives in the first violin. The first harmonic phrase follows the style of the previous two sections by consisting of two motivic phrases. However, section C consists of three harmonic phrases as opposed to two, with the second and third being only four measures in length each. The third harmonic phrase serves as a modulation back to the home key of E minor. Section D is not only a return to the home key of E minor, but it is a recapitulation of the initial A1 phrase. However, in terms of its overall structure, it differs from the A and B sections because instead of four four-measure motivic phrases, there are only three. However, there are still two harmonic phrases. The harmonic phrases are each six measures long. This means that the harmonic phrase actually changes in the middle of a motivic phrase. One. The chord progression itself is also different, the most obvious being the use of cadential 6 fours and the use of a deceptive cadence, which is the cadence in the middle of the motivic phrase. So section E is a recapitulation of section C. The motivic phrasing is the exact same as section C. The difference between section E and section C is the harmonic phrasing. While harmonically they are similar because just like in section C, there is a modulation into the key of G major, and then the last four measures modulate back to E minor. The harmonic phrasing itself is quite different as it does not line up with the motivic phrasing. And also notably the lengths of the harmonic phrases are not the same. So the coda only really makes up one full harmonic phrase. However, the phrases can be divided motivically based on the placement of the caesura at the end of measure 84. Overall, the coda really just shows a return of several key motives throughout the piece as an overall recapitulation of the material.
My response composition is the second movement from Four Less Waltzes, and it is entitled Judgy Waltz. Now, the most obvious difference between my response composition and Levin's work is that this is a quartet for B flat clarinet, two violins, and viola. I did this partially because I wanted the entire group to be able to play this piece together. I also did it because I wanted to stay true to Levin's style of assigning instruments, uh, specific parts, such as an accompaniment role, a bass line role, a melody role, but I also wanted to stay true to my personal compositional style, which is much more rooted in counterpoint and the movement of melodic lines throughout the ensemble. I also really wanted to move the melodic lines throughout the ensemble because this being a class focused on the idea of music in place, I wanted to create a musical place by having the music physically feel like it's moving around as we're playing it. So this is not necessarily just a response composition to Levin's work, but it is also a response composition to the class itself. I also wanted the different parts to come in gradually, also playing into that idea of the movement of the sound within the place itself, which does differ from Levin's style. So as you can see, it starts with the first violin coming in, then the viola, then the second violin, then the clarinet. I did a lot of moving of phrases between the clarinet and two violins. The viola overall has an accompaniment role throughout the entire piece, but it was something that um, I felt like we needed a strong bass line, especially being mainly a group of higher instruments. I also tried to utilize the lower range of the clarinet in order to get more of a bassy sound in some parts. Just as Levin used harmony and motives to structure his piece, I wanted to do the same with mine. The primary motive is here. This is the primary theme. As you can see in the first iteration, in the first phrase, which ends here, it is played in the first violin. It then moves to the second violin while the first violin takes over the initial second roll. This continues throughout the entire piece, as you can see, is repeated this eighth note motive that is happening here throughout this, both the second violin part as well as the clarinet part. Similar to Levin's Waltz, there is a modulation into the relative major, and it's also marked with a change in the melody, specifically a change to a more light staccato, delicate melody as compared to the previous theme. I did take some creative liberties, and there were some differences between this and Levin's piece. Specifically, before returning to the original key, I decided to spend some time in the minor dominant. So instead Instead of returning to the home key of G major, I, after being in B flat major, I decided I was going to return to or make a stop in the key of D minor here at D. This part, I was able to use the primary motive, but really use the accompaniment to make that primary motive sound quite different in terms of style and character. It sounded as though there was a lot more tension. I felt like part of it was there were tighter chords. It was lower in the register of the instruments and also the lines that we were playing. We were playing the same notes over and over again instead of outlining chords and it created a very different effect. And I thought that that was really interesting. That was not something that occurred in Levin's piece, but was something that ended up happening during my compositional process that when I brought it in to rehearsal and showed it to them, they were all very excited by that part. So I decided to continue using those motives and also filled in some spots where I wasn't sure of motives with those particular motives, which are very much more my style of motives than Levin's but it kind of makes this piece more its own while still really following what Levin did in terms of structure. The actual 
physical space that we performed in was the Miami University Rec Center. We set up tables in the lobby where people use their IDs to swipe in. This was a really interesting space because it had some really interesting characteristics that we didn't really anticipate. When we first did our preview concert, just a little snippet of our original repertoire, we noticed a couple of things like the acoustics were really interesting. It was a very wet acoustic environment, so very echoey. It made it hard to hear each other as performers, but it sounded really cool inside the space. We also noticed that the space had a certain kind of audience, and that is mostly just people walking in, turning in their IDs and going off and doing whatever. So they don't listen to the whole piece, they just sort of hear a little bit of it and then they're on their way. But we found that a lot of audience members who were walking by were interested and they were talking about it or taking videos. And we had one audience member actually sit down and listen to a few of the pieces on the nearby bench, which was really cool. In terms of place, it's important to consider the difference between space, the literal physical space that we performed in, and place. And, and the way that I'm thinking about this is sort of the place of the music within the space of the rec center, as well as within the audience and within the context of the performers. That's us. The music itself has a place in the venue as sort of like a free sample almost, because you aren't sitting down and listening to an entire concert. It's sort of more to the effect of, you know, this is sort of an intriguing thing that maybe I could be considered interested in, having just heard a little bit, or even, you know, even if they don't have continuing interest, maybe something like, oh, this is kind of cool, or this is interesting, or I've never seen this before, which is valuable as a performance to, to provide something like that, a, a unique experience that hasn't really been done before or seen by anybody. So that's the place of the music within the venue, but the place of the music within the audience and the performers is interesting as well, because within the audience, we could see when people were interested, when people weren't. We had some people clap. The people who worked behind the counter right outside of where we were set up uh, had to listen to the whole performance, whether they sort of wanted to or not, but we think they enjoyed it anyway. We hope they did it anyway. And then for us, our place with the music inside of this venue, sort of, it, it makes me think that this is something that in order to have a sort of successful outreach and a continuing impact on the audience and the people who are attendees of the rec center or people who we want to maybe listen to classical music more and consider this more, um, it would have to be a repeated thing. I think just a one-off concert gets people interested and people think, oh, that's kind of novel, it's kind of neat, but it doesn't have a lot of power on its own to get people to really pursue classical music as an interest. The performance itself, because of the space that we were in, we decided to go with casual attire. We wore shorts and flannels and, and just regular t-shirts underneath. Uh, there was talking in between the pieces, so it was a very casual environment, and I think that this um, served us well. I think it would have been a little too outlandish, right? A little bit too um, disconnected from the space that we were in to show up in like concert black uh, and provide programs and be very serious, overly serious, right? We were serious while we were playing the music and we were seriously invested and we performed the same way that we had during our rehearsals, right? With precision and, and all of these things that make classical music the way that it is. But because it, we were dressed more casually and because the, the environment was a little more casual, I think that also gave people more freedom to interact with us. We had some people clap, we had some people cheer. All of these things are things that we had to think about once we chose this venue and after having performed there once for a preview concert uh, and things that we sort of realized as we were playing uh, through our full repertoire. I hope you enjoyed this lecture recital. Thank you very much.